Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. And to start with, I have somebody who said, why do you say Family Life in the North Country? Is Family Life in the North Country different from anywhere else? Well, Family Life, wherever you find it, is more alike than different. Anywhere you go throughout history, this is what you find. But each place has its own distinctive characteristics. And so that's why I say family life in the North Country, to try to give it a little local color. Because most of what my comments are, I hope, would pertain to and apply to people who are living right around here. So here's another one. It says, what do you think about the number of suicides happening in our area lately? Well, on a long run, the suicide rate doesn't change much. I've studied suicides for many years, and you may have a rash of them, or you may have a cluster of them that seems to occur, um, like three or four all of a sudden in some place. But when you start looking at the, uh, uh, the overall pattern, you'll also have a drought. In other words, it'll be sometimes long periods of time, places like this, or you won't have any suicides, you won't have any occurring. See, right around here now, we had to run into almost three counties to get 100,000 people. And so the suicide rate's based on how many suicides per 100,000 people per year. And the national average is something a little over 12. That's all ages, all groups, all causes. So uh, when we read or hear about several suicides in a row, we have to think about it. Of course, if it happens to somebody we know, that's very close, and that makes it seem like it's it's uh, quite serious, quite important. There are 10 kinds of suicides, and sometimes they cluster. Sometimes uh, some national event will trigger them, like a copycat suicide. Uh, people want to do things. I think some of these uh, school shootings are copycat incidents, not necessarily suicide, but most of the, the perpetrators suicided in the act. And there's also a suicide by murder. Sometimes people do things deliberately and their intention is to get killed. And when that happens, that's basically a suicide is a motivation, but unfortunately it takes other people along with them. Here's another one. It says, how do you explain the recent problems reported in daycare for children um, as contracted with children who were home-reared? I like the question, home-reared. I don't recall hearing that expression before. We just take it for granted. But uh, I think what happens to children in, uh, in daycare is not really unexpected. Most of you, around here at least, have probably seen chickens, <clears throat> pecking order. Chickens are picked on to illustrate the pecking order, but um, if you haven't, I'll uh, take a little time to explain it, because it happens in uh, other animals besides chickens, and it also happens in people. It's been established pretty clearly. There's usually one individual who's able to pick on, peck, as the chickens on any, any of the others. And there are two under that one. And those two will compete to see which one's going to be the leader. Whichever one of them beats the other one then will take on the leader. And those can peck on and pick on anybody who's below them. And then there's another layer of people who are competing to get to the top and they fight each other. and they're in charge of, or peck on, pick on, bully, any of them below those, that rank. And so on it goes, and our, our whole society is sort of set up on a pecking order. This is what I think is happening in daycare centers. These children, oftentimes dropped off early in the morning, while mother goes to work, or dad goes to work, or both of them go to work, <clears throat> they're there. They don't have the usual authority. They don't have the home security. And uh, I think one of the things they try to do is same thing other animals do. They establish a hierarchy. They establish who's in control. These are my toys. These are 
these are my things. This is my territory. And turn kids loose and you'll watch that happen. I think, uh, oh, a few months ago, I think I saw a program on bull elephants where this was happening. That these young male elephants reared uh, by themselves without a mature adult became rogues, became very destructive. Maybe we see the same thing in daycare. I think that's a big factor. Uh, See, the parents are delegating their authority, but is it really the same authority? There's a lot of, there are a lot of factors going on in this daycare question. Um, don't forget the impact of television and movies and the media today. We're seeing a lot more violence, uh, much more than we used to, and some of it at least what I've seen seems to be violence for violence sake. It's just there, not to achieve a uh, particular end result. And children, of course, see a lot of that. And so I think that's a factor. And those people say, well, they're not really influenced. There are people who claim that. It's not really a big influence on children. Well, the people who pay for the advertising seem to think it's a big influence or they wouldn't do it. So what goes on is important in the media. Well, here's another one. It says, <clears throat> are you in favor of penalties against someone who harms a fetus and yet favors a death penalty? Well, <clears throat> I've seen several different things happening in the, uh, the printed media lately read several different newspapers, columnists on this. And right now there's a bill in the uh, New York legislature and one just passed the federal Congress on this subject. In other words, if somebody willfully and deliberately uh, tries to hurt a pre-born baby, uh, should that be a crime? Right now, in New York, it is not a crime. It's a, a misdemeanor to assault the mother. But any harm that comes to the child is, uh, that's just incidental, according to the current law. Now, it used to be different. And so basically, uh, what they want to do, some of the people, is to put that back. And what happened in one of the bills in the uh, U.S. Congress is made that a penalty, a crime, uh, if it passes and goes all the way through. But here's what I find is really troublesome about that question. Number one, I'm in favor of defending the life of the unborn. That's always been that uh, position, always clear on that as far as I know. But here's what I find troublesome. I find that a lot of people who will come along and let's say it's the father of the child. This is what happens sometimes. The father of the child decides that uh, he doesn't want that particular child or he doesn't want to be the father. He doesn't want to, the obligations or whatever. And so he does something or tries to do something to cause an abortion, to kill the child. Now, there are several columnists lately, and some of the people who are proposing legislation in this, they want to make that a crime. The troublesome part to me is I don't see the difference. Suppose the mother wants to do it. Oh, that's, that's a freedom of choice. If the mother wants to do it, same thing, destroy the child, and has it in fact destroyed, then, then that's not a crime. That's her right under the Roe versus Wade. To me, that doesn't make sense. Life is life, regardless whether it's a mother, the father, or somebody else who tries to destroy it. Somebody figured out I'm prejudiced on this area. I am, but I think in that particular instance, um, 
I don't think that's a prejudice. Except prejudice in favor of life. I'll prejudge always in favor of life. But I think it's uh, equality. I think if the mother willfully and deliberately tries to harm a child, that's just as serious as the father or some stranger doing so. Yeah, I'd be pleased for somebody to uh, try to enlighten me to show me how that doesn't work in logic. I just don't get it. Uh, but some some writers, some very well-known writers in national papers, seem to just miss that point altogether. Uh, makes me wonder about it. Well, here's another one. <clears throat> I went to a therapist who arranged uh, by my EPA at work, and the therapist told me I was suffering from burnout. What, what is that, burnout? I don't have a clue as to what your therapist had in mind. It's a popular term these days, but let's see if you can answer your own question. Your own question here is, what is burnout? Are you... Uh, Happy with the direction your life is going? Are you uh, able to look ahead five years and think that you'll be happy where it has been in those five years? And are you set an example of uh, how you think you should live and for other people to live like you do? If you answered no to those questions, any one of them, then the, perhaps what you've done is you've lost the why of life. I've talked about this from different perspectives, different times in the past. But this is what I find so often that people come up and say, well, I feel burned out. Uh, sometimes I find that these people haven't even been lighted yet. They, they haven't uh, been glowing. How can they burn out if there's no fire? Uh, they haven't caught on yet. And it's usually the same kind of thing. The work actually seems to have very little to do with it, in my opinion. Oh, I know some jobs are boring, but uh, you're supposed to get another job. If one job is boring and you're able to have the capacity to do something else, well, it's not set in concrete that you have to do the same kind of work all the time. Get a better job, one that's more suitable, more pleasing to you. And there is such thing as fatigue. People get tired of work, of course. You put in a good hard day's work, you have a right to be tired, whether it's mental work or physical work. You need a break. Well, that's not burnout, that's being tired. This so-called burnout thing is, in my book, is well overused, very much so. I don't know what it means most of the time. It's kind of like somebody saying, I had a nervous breakdown. I don't know what that means. <clears throat> I haven't a clue. I have to get a person to tell me, what do you mean when you say nervous breakdown? Well, burnout's the same way. I see people tired, drooping around, grumbling, whining. Uh, most of the time, they're not happy with their life. And if they're not happy with their life, what are they supposed to do about it? Why not get a life, as the saying goes? Why not look at your life and say, where do I want to be going? And what do I want to have done? What will I like to have accomplished five years from now? And get on the road. You can't get there unless you start. So uh, that would be my answer to the question about burnout. Think about it. <clears throat> you burned out or just haven't lighted up yet? Either way, there's no fire and there's no glow. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Hello. I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Start with today, I have a question about an eight-year-old. How long has it been since we were eight years old? Well, it says, my son, eight years old, seems to think he can run my house. I've been too lax, but how can I change? 
Well, first get a good idea of what it is you really want to change. Um, write it down. Go over it. Think about it. What is it you really want to change? And where's the father, by the way? Is he around? If the son wants to run the household, you and the father better agree on what it is you want to change. You have a, a pattern and a plan of what it is you really want to be different. And when you've agreed with that with your husband, hopefully the father, then talk it over with the son and tell him how things are going to change. Don't ask him if he wants to. Don't ask him if he wants to give you permission to change. Of course, I know you're the adult, and you make the changes. You tell him how it's going to be, and uh, practice it. It may not be easy. Now, when you think about it, you said you'd been too lax. Probably the eight-year-old would be delighted to give running the family back to you. That's a big job. You found out that yourself, didn't you? And that's what happens. Sometimes parents just are genuinely confronted. This is a big job, and they need all the help they can get. And what happens? Perfectly natural, human nature. A little child comes along and says, let me show you what all I can do. And sometimes I've seen it in families. I've seen little children, eight years old, excuse me, managing the household. I didn't mean doing all the work necessarily, but really making the decisions. You'd be surprised how often that occurs. You think about it. You listen to these people. Somebody say, well, I wonder what he wants for supper tonight. He would like this. He like that. And they're trying to please. The parent buys or gets something for supper. And uh, it goes a long ways. Decisions like that being made in reference to what the child wants. Well, who's running the household? How about your own wants? They should surface equally at least. Well, here's another question. Says my 19-year-old daughter, we go from 8 years old to 19. My 19-year-old daughter is attending a community college and taking a family course, and she brought a book back. One of her classes, I looked at it, and I was quite... To bothered by some of the content in this book. Uh, what exactly is a student supposed to learn in a family course? That's a good question. And uh, it's strange because so often family life is taught by a sociology department. So people are supposed to study sociology of the family or psychology of department and study the interpersonal relationships in the family, or an anthropology department, so people study the movement and the area of humanity in general. It used to be taught by home economics, and home economics uh, in most schools is sort of going by the wayside, but I've studied in all of them, taught in all of them, all the areas. And to answer your question more directly, <clears throat> uh, I think family life should teach people how to be better at being a member of a family, whatever one's role is. And I'm sort of prejudiced on that. People get the idea sometimes I'm prejudiced. Well, I'll admit it. But I have this old-fashioned notion that if I take a course in chemistry, I'm supposed to be a better chemist at the end of the course than I was at the beginning. Well, most people go along with that, whether the course is biology or botany or accounting, whatever. Well, I think the same thing applies to family life, and that's the way I taught family life. If you take a course in family life, you should be able to be a better person and be a better person in a family at the end of the course than at the beginning. Different from sociology, and I am a family sociologist. I uh, member of the American Sociological Association for years in the Family Life Division. But that's not teaching people how to be better at it. That's just studying what is or what was. Sometimes family courses even taught by history department where the history of the family is the focus. 
But I think family life ought to be taught to be better. And unfortunately, what happens in so many schools, and I find this particularly true in community college or junior colleges, they're sometimes called in other states, the administration assigns uh, just anybody to fill in the blanks, anybody to teach family course, thinking, well, we all have family, so everybody knows about family life. And they hand them a textbook, and away they go. Well, that's not an expert. That's not a scholar. That's not uh, even academic proficiency. That's just reading a textbook and staying one page ahead of the students. Uh, I've taught courses that way, but uh, never, not in family life. I've assigned and taught quite a few different courses, and some of them I really didn't have any expertise in. It was a requirement for school and did it. Uh, makes a big difference. And I think you'll find that if you were to ask any of the uh, 6,000 or so students I've had in family life courses, I think you'd find them in an agreement that I made an effort to have people better in family life than before. Now, some people don't want to be better. They just want the ability to go talk about families, what all is happening. Well, that's fine. You have to study what's happening in order to understand family life today, but uh, <clears throat> how about applying it? By the way, that type of course is called functional family course. And the Home Economics Department uh, used to teach it in, in high schools and in colleges. That used to be basically the area of home economics. And uh, interesting. And home economics even changed its pattern. But uh, I studied it in home economics. My doctoral studies included. It was an interdivisional doctoral program in family life. And it was psychology and sociology and home economics and finance. Um, the psychology, all these things had to be put together in, in uh, social work as well. Well, here's another one. It says, my wife and I argue over the question, when is it okay to tell a little white lie? What's your opinion on it in families? Well, it seems like I'm prejudiced about a lot of things, but telling white lies is something I'm also prejudiced about. It's just sort of strange to me. I uh, try to follow the, the good book on this. Even when I didn't even believe in a good book, I thought the good book had several things that were well worth adhering to, and that's one of them. I liked the Ten Commandments, <coughs> even if I didn't believe in religion at the time. Because I thought it was a, a good set of rules for people to follow. I followed a lot of other rules, too. You don't have to be religious to follow rules. But anywhere in the, I, I didn't find anywhere in the commandment that says, uh, shall not bear false witness, where it said, except, or sometimes. So I look at that, and I've done this ever since I was a youngster. It said, don't lie, basically. And I found that that's a, a very good policy. So I don't go for white lies. Uh, it used to be troublesome to me when I had, <laughs> I started to save my kingdom. One job I had for several years, I had 12 secretaries. And uh, they were doubling as typists and stenographers and clerks and everything else, but basically 12 of them. And it always troubled me, and I would tell them every new person, and then I'd have to tell them again after they came to work and say, look, if I'm in, I'm in. Don't tell people I'm not in. Uh, if I don't want to talk to somebody, tell them that I'm busy. I'll call them back. But don't tell people I'm not in. And that's what so many of them had been trained in business school and whatever, to say the boss isn't in. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what they meant was he's not in for you at the moment. Well, I, th I thought that was insulting to the caller to say, well, he's he's not in for you, he's in for somebody else. Well, that's the implied statement. I didn't like it. 
and with my own children about the white lies. I used to try to teach them that the truth is the truth. If I say something, then uh, I would like for them to think that that's the way it is. Uh, and I used to do this little experiment to try to get it across when they were old enough to drive or old enough to really pay attention to traffic. I would uh, drive up to a corner and say, are there any cars coming? Uh, or is the road clear? And with the illustration that if you say it's clear, I drive out there and I'm going to if you say it's clear, then you get the message very quickly how important it is to tell the truth. If you tell me there's something there and there isn't, well, it's not going to hurt anybody if I drive out there, but uh, uh, the opposite would, could get us all hurt. And so I'm a little strong on the white lies. And I think in families, I don't see the point of it. Now, it doesn't mean that I believe people should say everything they know about something, because I certainly don't. And I don't believe in being quiet about something, like uh, not gossiping, that that's lying. I think that's being fair. If you uh, know something about somebody that would do damage to them, if it were told, <clears throat> I think it's prudent to keep it quiet. Why do you have the right to spread bad information. Any one of us, hey, we have things in our closet. We've all fallen down. None of us are perfect. But we'd like for people not to go around just talking about our imperfections. We may have some good points about us. Wouldn't that be nice if we could say the nice things about people? And the opposite of that, I, I think I mentioned this one time on some program, but I, I was in court one time and got held in contempt of court because I went on the witness stand and typical as you've all heard it, seen it played if you haven't been there yourself and you raise your right hand and put your hand on a Bible or something and say, I swear to tell the whole truth nothing but the truth so help me God uh, you try to tell the whole truth in the court I tried to do that in the court one time, and the lawyer got all excited and bent out of shape. And I said, look, I just took an oath to tell the whole truth, and, and you're cutting me off before I even get started with the whole truth. Either I take back the oath, I ask the judge. Either you release me from this uh, oath I just took, or allow me to go ahead, get this lawyer to shut up. So I can tell the whole truth. Well, he banged his gavel and said, you're in contempt of court. And I said, well, what's the answer, Your Honor? Am I free to tell the whole truth, or am I not going to be allowed to tell the whole truth? He said, you're in contempt. Answer the questions of counsel. Well, that's a, yeah, maybe a bad example, but it is an example of the truth sometimes. Well, here's another one. We'll take this one for the last question for the, this particular program. It says, my 13-year-old daughter, hey, we bounce around. We've got an 8-year-old, a 19-year-old, and now a 13-year-old. She wants to go on a date. She looks 18, been going to school dances for a year. What's your opinion? Uh, my opinion is, what do you mean by date? What is a date in your family? What does she have in mind when she says a date? And... One she's supposed to go with, what does he have in mind for a date? Uh, I think she's about three years too young to go on an unchaperoned dance. Date? Dance or date? I'm opposed to the 12-year-olds going to school dances. I'm not sure what the schools are really doing. I know they're trying to be good and socialize. Uh, very few teachers have bad intentions. They all have good intentions. But you take a health class that teaches uh, nine and ten year olds to pleasure self in sexual affairs, self pleasuring and pleasuring others, and mutual pleasuring and all that sort of stuff. And don't kid yourself, I've seen some of the curriculum that's there. You do that with uh, nine and ten year olds, 
Then you have school dances. See, I think the schools then are contributing to something they don't want to be responsible for, and I think that's a bad deal. It's not a good thing at all. So, uh, find out what this idea of a date is, what's supposed to mean, what the restrictions are, and if they aren't to your satisfaction, my answer is, wait three years. Sixteen's plenty young to go on an unchaperoned dan or date. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. I have an interesting question. I think it's interesting because it pops up from time to time. This woman says, I'm going out with a man who's 12 years older than me. That's her statement. Is that too old? That's her question. Well, first, how old are you? If you're uh, 18, that's a little old. You'd be 30. If you're 60, it may not matter. It depends on uh, the people. The old rule of thumb, if you can go by rules of thumb, used to be that uh, it's best to go out with people or to be, allow yourself to become serious. People plus or minus five years, either five years older or five years younger. Meaning people who were within five years of each other's age, age didn't seem to be a problem. It doesn't have to be a problem anyway. There are plenty of uh, December-May combinations, old men and young women. <clears throat> Most of the time we don't see old women and young men. Uh, the nature of the beast just doesn't put that combination together very often, but they're occasional, and sometimes they work out. But uh, when you look at these big age discrepancies, you usually are looking at somebody's pocketbook. That's what usually you find there. Somebody has enough wealth, income, power, and resources to uh, make age sort of fade into the background. And uh, it's sort of the pattern all over the world and has been throughout history. The richest and the most powerful men in the uh, society, whatever society it was, could always uh, get younger and younger wives. In many societies they are wives. In some societies they're just companions. But even in those societies where uh, more than one wife is allowed, which by the way is a little over 80% of all the societies in the world allow that, even in those societies, only about 4% of the people practice it. And it's usually related to the income, the wealth, because in most of those societies, the basic rule is that a man has to support each wife equally to the others. And very few men can do that. So that's why even in the societies where it's allowed, and age is not a factor. Trying to support them all equally requires resources that the ordinary person doesn't have. But age differences uh, also uh, depend a little bit on your surroundings. And how old are your peers? How old are those people you socialize with? You know, if they have strong opinions about it one way or the other, that's going to influence your judgment. And uh, But age by itself is, 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 should be a big factor. Okay, here's another one. It says, my fiancé has been married before, and I've had a live-in boyfriend for two years. Before uh, meeting Jack, my fiancé, uh, when I hear people say things like that, they've been living with their fiancé, and I find that sometimes people have fiancés of the month. So we're talking about getting married and uh, having a family. And my pastor and my family have both told me that uh, we need to seek pre-marriage counseling. The pastor said pre-cana, 
And uh, my mother said I should ask you. Okay, I'm asking you. And the girl who wrote on that said, we both know how to live together. We both all had that experience, and she thinks it's silly to go and talk to somebody about how to get along. Well, here's the problem with that. The problem with that is you have a history of failure, not a history of success. You mention your fiancé has been married before. Well, he failed at that, didn't he? You mentioned you've had live-in boyfriends. That, in my book, is a failure. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Both you and Jack have baggage. <coughs> you need to, yes, talk to somebody and see what kind of baggage is going to interfere with your relationship. If you're serious about having a good marriage, and apparently you are, you're talking about a church wedding, and you have a pastor. But if you're really serious about that, uh, then get all the cards stacked in the right direction. Make things work for your advantage. And make it a good one. The very best you can. And this idea that <clears throat> just because you live with somebody gives you the experience. It gives you some experiences, but not necessarily on how to be well married. That's not just my opinion. That's the opinion of thousands of pieces of research in this area. And it surprises most people. Mm -hmm. It keeps on surprising most people that people who live together before marriage don't work out as well as those who don't. Well, here's another question. <clears throat> uh, this change of pattern is from a man. It says, my wife found out I've had a girlfriend and now she's so jealous. It's hard to live with her. Do you think there's any hope? Hope for what? What are you talking about? Hope. Hope for your wife that she won't become more difficult. Hope your girlfriend won't meet your wife. Uh, hope your wife uh, quits being jealous. Hope you can straighten out your life. What are you talking about, hope? You said your wife's getting hard to live with. What about you? You ever think about the shoe on the other foot? <clears throat> if I were to hear the wife's opinion here, you think about what's happened to her. <coughs> Chances are you married, <clears throat> did what most people do. They take the same vows, same promises, promise to, to be faithful. For richer, for poor, good times and bad sickness and in hell and basically remain faithful all your life it was very important about this sense of fidelity and you come along and say uh oh she found out I have a girlfriend and she's jealous is there any hope get your own life straightened out then there will be some hope there's plenty of hope not the first time it's happened. It won't be the last, and plenty of people learn how to get over it. But uh, get your ideas straight. Okay, we're back to women. Here she says, my husband is into pornography, and I'm disgusted. <coughs> is there anything that I can do to get him to stop it? Pornography. Now, sometimes pornography is an addiction, or more appropriately, it's an habituation. In other words, people have a habit of it. And uh, they use it as a substitute. So why is your husband into pornography? Have you ever asked him? What are you into it for? What do you get out of it? What do you, uh, what do you want out of it? And don't ask the question <clears throat> unless you're really willing to take the answer. Because you may not like the answer if he's honest. Because it may reflect on you. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's kind of sad. Sometimes people use pornography sort of like jump-starting a battery. Um, 
That's their intention, but most of the time that backfires. It might jump start it for a short time, but then it backfires and it doesn't even do that. That's what some carefully controlled studies have shown. That even when both husband and wife are involved in pornography, mutual consent, where it's not a moral problem, their sex life usually goes down, not up. Uh, most of the time when one partner finds out the other one is into pornography, it's degrading. It makes a person feel, oh, what's wrong with me? And that's male or female. Now, most of the time it's the man who's involved in pornography. Except, the last time I saw a, a part of a soap opera in the afternoon, I've never watched the whole program all the way through, but my impression was that that was afternoon pornography. Uh, sometimes uh, I find that uh, the wife may be uh, upset because the husband has his evening pornography, but she has her afternoon pornography. They call it soap operas. Well, <clears throat> I don't know enough about soap operas lately. I used to keep track of them. I've studied them, even though I never really watched them. I studied the impact and the themes and the subjects. Even did a statewide research project on soap operas. What's going on? People can stop pornography. They, they stop it. It has no withdrawal symptoms. There's no side effect. But uh, most people don't want to because it's serving some particular purpose. So my suggestion is to find out what the purpose is. Work on that. Try to correct that. Things should work out all right for you. Well, here's another one. It says, a recent article in the paper recommended teaching religion, all religions to all children. What do you think about it since you recommended putting the Ten Commandments in schools? Well, I think it's foolish to teach religion, all religions to all children. That, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. For example, I think that is comparable to showing children pictures of all the cars in today's market and then expect them to know how to drive. You teach people all religions, that doesn't teach them how to live a particular religion. I think people have to, to use the same comparison. I think children need to learn how to drive one car, and then they'll be able to relate it to others. But to, uh, to be exposed, you know, I studied uh, religions at one time, <clears throat> before I decided on what church and religious group I was going to join. <clears throat> and it's quite consistent with uh, research findings of others in education that uh, young children can't really handle the abstractness in the comparative religion courses. They need to learn probably their parents' religion and learn it well, and then they can later make comparisons and make their own choices. That would seem to me to be the best thing to do. Rather than trying to expose children to all the religions, I found out there's so many of them. And I thought I was grown. I'd been a professional for many years when I started studying religions. But I found it uh, very difficult to try to really come to grips with all the different things about religion, to really have a, any kind of working knowledge with which and by which to make some good judgment. It took me several years. And that's not what me, people are talking about in terms of exposing children to all religions. They're talking about one semester kind of thing, a one-year course in comparative religions. Well, I'm very much opposed to that. Most children, that's way over their head. It's too too deep for them. 
Okay, here's another one. So, so there's some people that you just can't get along with. A person went on to describe this particular pattern. And I think that's true. I think the answer is yes. You know, most of us are very much uh, into thinking, well, there are people we seem to get along with from the beginning, right off, from the start. We say, well, we had good chemistry. Well, if that's true, then why wouldn't there be the opposite? The people you uh, would have bad chemistry with. I think that's just as logical. And fortunately, there have been a few times when I think I've seen this in families. I think I've seen it between a parent and a child where they had a not just a difference in opinion about things, but they seem to be, pretty strong word, but allergic to each other, that they really uh, didn't get along. And having worked with some families like that, fortunately not, not often, but I think there is that possibility that yes, there can be some bad chemistry. Um, and when that happens, well, the best thing to do is to recognize it. And quit blaming the other person. Quit blaming the other person for um, something that that person is not doing deliberately. <clears throat> Here's a question. It says, my wife is always late. Is there anything I can do about it? Yeah, get used to it. That'd be my suggestion. But if you find a cure for it, let me know. My wife's always late, too. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good day. Hello. I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Started with a question I found rather interesting. It says, from an article in the paper, gays can go straight. Uh, have you ever seen that happen? Yes, I've seen that happen numerous times. Unfortunately, though, the uh, media and a great deal of prejudice follows that so that <clears throat> a lot of people today don't believe that if a person decides to change uh, that they really can but i've seen it happen a lot i think the logic is there if a person can change uh, one way why couldn't a person change the other way what what is it that says it's set in concrete i just don't believe it is it doesn't say i don't pretend that it's easy but it can happen and does happen. Uh, here's another one. Came up recently, says, uh, do counselors, therapists, and psychiatrists have a right to file claims for non-payment when people uh, don't pay their bills because of the confidentiality rules? Well, it is an interesting question because of the confidentiality. But the truth is, yes, a contract is a contract. So that if uh, I make a contract with somebody, I'm agreeing to do certain things or make an effort to do so, and the other person is agreeing to pay me for my time. And there's an old rule that says everybody's entitled to be paid for time and effort, the old work law. Now, to file a claim for payment, very few people do, because it's not good public relations. So you don't have to release uh, confidential information to file a claim. All you have to do is to file the name and the time and the services uh, rendered and uh, the amount that is due. There would be very little relevance uh, of a confidential file to be taken into court. Uh, 
But if somebody doesn't pay, then actually I think the courts have ruled that uh, confidentiality laws are not in force. In other words, if a person doesn't fulfill a contract, part of the contract was to keep it confidential. But if you don't pay for the services, you're breaking the contract. The client's breaking the contract. But it doesn't give the uh, professional the right to spread about information. But uh, it's still bad public relations. So I know very few times that anybody's ever filed for a claim. And uh, it would tend to backfire, I think. I never have filed for a claim on anybody. I uh, have a lot of people who owe me money, though, too. Uh, here's another one. It says, uh, you're always talking about mothers' duties to their children. What about the fathers? Yes. I'm very strongly in favor of fathers' duties, and I think the primary duty of a father is to provide and protect. And... Uh, Providing is rather simple. Most people can understand that. Support, providing for necessities. I'm not sure providing includes uh, just all the wants of child. Uh, that's not a requirement, but for the necessities, absolutely. Now, how about the protection? That's a harder thing to try to define. Protection from what? Well, I think the fathers should be sufficiently invested in their children and their families to know what is damaging and harmful to the children, to know what it is and where it's coming from. There are the worlds of things out there that are damaging and har harmful, really threatening. But uh, how many fathers even take the trouble to know about them? Say, ah, you know, there are no bad animals or robbers running around and stuff like that. Well, there are in a few places, but uh, some of the uh, very serious threats to the family are coming in very, uh, coming in very quietly. And some of them aren't very quietly. Some of the educational programs themselves are a threat. And for fathers who, uh, who abandon their children, who simply turn their back and walk away, make no pretense of being responsible. I have very strong opinions about that. In fact, I've been on record down in Texas of helping send some people to jail for that sort of thing, child abandonment. I've never heard of people going to jail up here, but uh, I haven't been involved in any cases either. Uh, where that would be likely now. Just because I haven't been involved doesn't mean that there aren't cases around. I know them and I see them. But it's not my duty if I'm not involved in the case to do anything if somebody doesn't ask me. Well, here's a question that comes up. <clears throat> uh, I hear it being discussed quite often. Why are so many young people today seemingly not getting married? Um, they seemingly not getting married. Well, they aren't getting married in anywhere near the proportion that they used to. There's several answers to that question. It's a simple question, but it's, a, I think, a rather complicated uh, answer. Number one is, uh, and not necessarily the most important, but just to sort of give an itemization, young people value marriage. They put it on a very high plane, and they're trying to avoid divorce at all costs. It's interesting, isn't it? Some people uh, have the opinion that the way to avoid divorce is don't get married. And yet they're acting like it. I think one of the causes of this sort of thing is the permissiveness permissiveness and social standards. We certainly slipped a long ways from what it used to be. Um, the media plays a very large part in this. All sorts of media, printed, electronic media, uh, programming, it's what you see most of the time. 
And if you've ever watched a soap opera, what else is on the soap opera besides uh, really a breakdown of family values? I say that as uh, I'm not a, a fan of soap operas. I've never actually watched a program all the way through, but I've made a study of them over the years. The themes, what are they doing? Another reason kids aren't getting married today is the prevailing belief of do your own thing. Whatever you want to do is all right. Do your own thing as long as it feels good, do it. And if you don't feel right about it, don't do it. Well, a lot of people are applying that to uh, marriages. I know some people, and probably all of you observing the program would know some too, who said, yes, we're going to get married. We've set the date, like uh, New Year's or July the 4th, or, but we haven't set the year yet. Uh, it's kind of a strange thing. We know that another reason is the moral teachings. Very few people are being taught that it's morally incorrect to live together as if married when you're not. Very few people talk about this sort of thing. Very few preachers, ministers, priests, or rabbis really talk about it from the pulpit. A few do. But uh, the absence of that sort of thing uh, is a factor. Now, it's not just young people who aren't getting married. Some people forget that old people aren't getting married also. And they're moving in, shacking up, roommating, whatever the words may be, sometimes because of the uh, threat of Social Security. In other words, in Social Security, if, if a widower remarries, a widow, she loses her benefits. If she may have been receiving from the first spouse, or he, as the case may be. <laughs> so some people are living together strictly for financial reasons, regardless of age, and some of the old people are doing this sort of thing too. And that started back in the 60s. Um, the reasons people aren't getting married uh, many answers. You listen to people, you think about it. Uh, colleges even got into helping people not get married. I remember here at uh, Plattsburgh State when then uh, president of the college, George Angel, took a survey. Took a survey from of the students about integrating the dormitories. And most students at that time were opposed to integrating the dormitories. But he was involved with um, the need for uh, receiving federal funds and some grants, and grant money uh, at that time was based on whether or not uh, there was segregation being practiced. So in effect, he had to make some kind of effort to show that there was no segregation going on in the Plattsburgh State Campus. Um, so in spite of the student vote, he never did publish them, as far as I know, but he integrated the dorms one floor at, at a time, and then after that they were integrated. One wing would be males and the other wing would be females. So gradually... Uh, the barrier broke down when colleges were said to be no longer in loco parentis. They were not acting in the place of and taking the place of parents. So the colleges and the schools really got into it. Well, what happened? Human nature being like it is, young people with newly acquired blossoming hormones and all their sex drives, well, what we saw in colleges was... Uh, more and more they were staying together, uh, roommates, swapping roommates, so that uh, the dormitory had the right number of people in it, but not necessarily the right agenda and the right rooms. Then there's another reason that people don't get married, and that's peer pressure. Uh, you know, peer pressure is the pressure to be like a those around you are to avoid being different from those around you either way 
so with more and more people not getting married and young people making a joke of it and even being surprised uh, when people aren't living together, uh, that's a peer pressure. Uh, I'm well aware that there are some people who say, no way. They're absolutely not going to do this. They don't believe in it. They believe in a certain moral standard, and they adhere to it. Well, I salute those people. But they're getting to be um, really in a minority. And uh, I think a recent poll showed that uh, almost half of the males had lived with someone before marriage, and uh, almost half of the males who said so had lived with more than one person. In other words, they had had a series of partners. Not quite as many females have lived together before marriage, and it gets to be uh, very sad. I am involved in uh, pre kina orientation, and uh, that's very sad. For example, in, in the most recent uh, pre kina marriage preparation, uh, conducted uh, under the auspices of the Catholic Church. At the most recent one where I was a participant in trying to help people prepare for marriage, I think I was, and I know what I was told uh, by the people who headed it up, that uh, 23 out of the 26 couples present were already living together at that time. Now, that's kind of sad. And we need to take stock and we need to look, really look into this. And you see what I mean now about, it's a simple question, why aren't people getting married today? But when you start looking at the answers, it uh, gets to be kind of complicated. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Start with today. It says, what is your view of foster care? I hear that there's a problem. Well, interestingly, there has to be a problem or there is no foster care. In other words, foster care is a substitute for families, uh, intended to be a substitute for an intact family. So there has to be a problem with the family, or indeed there wouldn't be the need for foster care. Um, I haven't been involved in foster care locally in quite a while. But I am familiar with uh, some reports on the national scene, and uh, my views haven't changed very much. Uh, and what I'm hearing today, it's really overworked and overused, and children are being bounced from one foster care to another one. Some kids are, are being passed around, they're living in as many as 10 different foster homes over a period of years. Uh, and that's, that's kind of sad. When you look at that, there's some foster parents who are just beautiful, you couldn't beat them, you couldn't ask for them to be better. Then there are some who uh, shouldn't be in it at all, shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. I don't, uh, the more I study and read about foster care, I don't really like the idea. I think we ought to follow the old pattern of let's solve the problems at home first. If we put as much effort into solving the problems in the family as we do in trying to make a placement for kids and hiring people to supervise and check out foster parents and do all those other kinds of things, I think we'd have a better chance of serving the kids and what they really need. What's going on now is uh, we're spending an enormous amount of money in foster care, and I don't think we're getting the benefit of it. You know, orphanages have gone out of style. But instead of foster care, the way I've been seeing so much of it, or I have seen in the past, not lately, just because I haven't been in doing that sort of thing, I'd much rather see kids in an orphan's home. I know I mentioned it uh, 
two years ago on this program that when I was a psychologist with the Texas Department of Mental Health, when I first started, the or state orphans' homes were under the same department. Now, the kids in the orphans' homes didn't like it when I would drive up to visit them and have they had foot-high signs on the side of the car. Department of Mental Health, Department of Wheeler Mossner Institutions. But uh, what I saw was uh, very good. And I, as, as a consulting psychologist of state orphans' homes, I had a chance to visit, and I visited around in different homes, a Methodist home, home run by Baptist Church, home run by the Seventh-day Adventist, home run by the Church of Christ, the uh, Masonic Lodge, and I never found a bad one. Now, I found occasionally a bad person, a bad caretaker, a bad house parent, occasionally. <clears throat> but not anywhere near the problems that seem to have occurred in foster care. What I saw in these homes that I had the opportunity of visiting, very well-behaved children, eager to learn, eager to start their own families. These kids out of orphans' homes seem to make good family people. And uh, I think they were stable and secure, and that was very important. These kids didn't get bounced around. They could have their own football teams on one of those very big competitions in Waco, Texas, because they were just across the highway from each other was a Methodist home and the state orphans home. And they had intense rivalry in football and basketball and things like that, and, and it was all very well done. Uh, the intensity of that rivalry, they really competed for excellence. The people who were supporting the private home were um, involved trying to make it better than the state home. And the kids in the state home, of course, were very much wanting to be not second class to anybody, just being kids. And uh, that reminds me, I told a little story about one time, the the big boss, the commissioner of mental health, called me and said there's a problem down at uh, Corsicana State Home, Corsicana, Texas. He said, we have a new counselor down there, and uh, he's pulling his hair. He really doesn't know what to do with the problem. He thinks we have a lot of mentally ill kids down there in that home. So the boss said... Uh, Go down there and see what's going on. Check it out. Well, before I even got out of the car, I knew something was wrong. Because the kids were waiting for me. They were hiding and looking out from behind the shrubs and things like that. And I thought, uh-oh, they're part of this problem. So I went in, and sure enough, the uh, <clears throat> I found out it didn't take very long found out that the kids had stolen the answers to the test questions, that this new counselor had decided he was going to go in and give all these kids some kind of personality test to see which ones needed his special help and special skills. Well, the kids played a trick on him. They had stolen the answers, and so they answered everything negative. In other words, they were as psychotic and as psychopathic as anybody could have been on a scale, according to the test results. And they were doing it deliberately, and they were having a big kick out of it. And that's what they were looking forward to my coming, because they couldn't keep it to themselves very long. They'd pull this fast, and then poor old Seth was just, he was pulling his hair, what little he had left. When I got there, he didn't know what to do with all these psychotic kids. Well, they weren't psychotic. <laughs> they were just kids, and I remember it uh, very well. So I called the boss and told him, oh, the kids are just acting kids. They stole the test results, and uh, nothing bad happened at all. Kids got all right. They were having fun. <clears throat> well, here's another question. It says, has the women's movement had an economic impact? 
Uh, in other words, uh, what's happened to the economy with the women's movement? Well, what's happened is that uh, the men, if you haven't noticed, they haven't tried to become more feminine, but women have tried to become more masculine. And if you haven't noticed, uh, very few men have babies. So number one, the birth rate's gone way down with the women's movement. Women who are in the workforce don't have as many babies. Uh, the birth rate has always uh, sort of gone up and down. But since 1800, when the records first started being kept, there's been a gradual decline of birth rate, which corresponds <clears throat> with a lot of different social movements. But it was on that basis that uh, in 1972, it was predicted by some people who were studying these things, I remember it very well, that there were not to be any babies born in 1972. Because the decline in the birth rate has gone down so consistently that in 1972 it would be at zero. Well, obviously some people hadn't read the book, so they had some babies, and babies were contented to be born. But the economic impact of women's lib movement <coughs> basically seems to have uh, lowered standard of living, comparatively speaking. Because we have two workers now, where we used to have just one. We have two workers uh, supporting a family. And um, that standard of living double? No. So comparatively speaking, it has uh, not kept pace at all. Um, it may be that soon we'll become a nation with only one child per family. You know, like China mandates this. They restrict their couples to one child per couple. And one child, that's all. <clears throat> if a woman wants to have another one, or the man, uh, the state may come in and force an abortion. <clears throat> and all sorts of sanctions might be applied. In other words, they may not get the benefits or whatever it is they're entitled to if they don't follow the rule. And that's already sad because way back in 72, we were already below uh, the zero population growth. It takes 2.1 children, so, so the statisticians tell us, for the nation to uh, replenish itself. So it's having a very large impact. The, the major impact is with a decreased birth rate. The major impact here is uh, with one child, we won't have enough people to support the future generations. One child per family won't do it. So you're already hearing about the clamor of Social Security and Social Security going broke. Most people don't relate that to the birth rate but it's very definitely part of the birth rate. It takes so many people working to support so many people who aren't working, who are on, who are retired, are on pensions, are disabled. It takes a certain, that's called the dependency ratio, a certain number of people. And one child per family won't do it. You can't have, you can't have one worker supporting two old people and himself or herself, and his own or her own family. That just won't do it. You have to have a, a greater number of people, or indeed Social Security is going to have something dramatic happen to it. Speaking of Social Security, not on this subject, but uh, it may be bad politics to raise the age limit, uh, the age uh, in which people can retire, but it certainly makes sense. We're living much longer now than we were in 1937 when Social Security payments first started being made. Uh, the life expectancy at that time it wasn't anywhere near what it is today, some 20 years younger. Today, with most people living around 76 years of age, so they expect roughly 11, 12 years on Social Security benefits after age 65. The well, Social Security system wasn't set up to take care of that large number of people because when it was set up, the average age of death was uh, much younger. 
So that's a factor, and it's going to have to be adjusted. That's just part of the ongoing problem. <clears throat> and uh, somewhere along the way, I remember when the first uh, came out about all these raises and cost of living increases with Social Security. Nothing in it at that time, nothing in the laws at that time said that Social Security would ever go down. There was always cost of living increases. I remember asking the uh, district director of Social Security in the Plattsburgh office. I said, am I reading this correctly? Because the way I read the new Social Security laws on cost of living, it's only set to go up. Never adjusted down. Well, it actually the assistant manager at the time told me, yes, that's the way the law is seems to be written. And it's uh, something peculiar. As if our economy doesn't go up and down at times. Well, of course it does. It has to. If stock market doesn't ever go down, nobody makes money. Uh, it has to rise and fall for profits to be made. But that's another topic, isn't it? <clears throat> um, but it's a very serious topic, and most people say, well, I don't want my benefits cut. Well, naturally, nobody wants benefits cut. But if you don't want your benefits cut, you rather have your benefits stay where they are and then your children not receive any benefits when they become older. It's, uh, we're changing all sorts of ways of looking at older people nowadays. For example, middle age used to start at uh, 45. Now, a lot of people today think middle age starts around 65 because there are a lot of people who are in better health. We live longer. What is middle age? Retirement, people are wanting to retire younger and live longer and enjoy time off. Of course, that's human nature. Why shouldn't it? But uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that's good for the economy. Well, I better get out of the economy, but it does have a whole lot to do with the family life. So until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. We have a question here that says, are the people who elect to marry having better marriages today than they did in the past? You know, it seems that with the fewer number of people getting married and how much trouble people go to, uh, that the assumption could be, yes, well, they're having, those who do get married are having better marriages. Uh, so I had to look around to find an answer to that question. I found a piece of research that uh, suggests that's not happening. The more traditional a couple, and this is comparing decades, like uh, marriages surveyed 10 years ago and 20 years ago with marriages today, the more traditional couples report better marriages the less traditional couples, in other words, the more uh, equality they have, which is a good thing on the one hand, but on the other hand it's uh, not necessarily a good thing, the more squabbling there is that goes on in a family. So that both men and women are not today reporting as uh, happy and content marriages as apparently they once were. Makes it rather interesting, doesn't it? The uh, propaganda here that we could always, and I was teaching family life 30 years ago. I know what the books were saying, the latest books, the latest articles, and they were usually laying the problem uh, in the families to the fact that women were subservient, that women uh, in non traditional, or correction, in the traditional family at that time. Uh, the woman's unhappiness was due to 
having to be in a subservient role. Well, it turns out that's not the case. Uh, there isn't any point in trying to promote any any person being subservient. But the way the family's organized, if they have clearly different roles, then that seems to make for a better family. If everybody's trying to do the same thing, like today, much more so than in the past, that doesn't seem to be really working to benefit the family. Well, here's another question. <laughs> Interesting. It says, my brother insists that there's no uh, research showing secondary smoke being harmful. Uh, the question was, is it true? Secondary smoke. <clears throat> Here's what's going on so often. There are studies showing secondary smoke to be harmful, but I don't know where your brother's looking. What's happening also is a strange kind of thing. Some studies on daycare. You know, a lot of parents today are really thinking that uh, it's healthy to have a smoke-free environment. Well, I agree with that. I think that's great. <clears throat> and I'm all for it. However, a lot of people who have a smoke-free home and won't allow people to smoke in their home will turn their kids over to a day center daycare center that's not smoke free and the daycare center people are smoking and uh, not necessarily directly in contact but within the air system of the daycare center here's what's happened the pediatricians have found studies have found uh, without explaining why that boys are much more susceptible the secondhand smoke than girls are. The male baby is much more likely to pick up a problem from secondhand smoke than a female. I don't know why that is, but it's a factor there. <clears throat> so too bad about your brother. Uh, there are studies, and apparently well documented studies, about secondhand smoke. Here's a question: it says, uh, Do you think mercy killing is being practiced today? Yes, under a variety of names, assisted suicide, uh, helping someone cross the bar, and so on, but by a variety of names, but mercy killing is still killing. And uh, I'm told <clears throat> by friends I know who work in nursing homes and hospitals that indeed it is occurring in all the facilities. And uh, it seems that a lot of these, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of these uh, actions are being slipped in with different labels and different words uh, to make it uh, less of a threat, like mercy killing. That implies that the person being killed <coughs> is suffering. <coughs> excuse me, well... That doesn't necessarily follow. Someone may be in a coma and not be suffering at all. Someone may be suffering a great deal who's fully competent, uh, but doesn't want to be killed. And we have some strange laws on the books right now, already on the books, that uh, I think I mentioned this recently on a program, that allows a physician to determine whether or not a do not resuscitate, a DNR order should be written for a certain patient, allows a physician to get another physician to agree with him and enter it without ever discussing it with a patient, even though that patient may be mentally competent. When people really stop looking to see what the law already allows, I think most people would be quite surprised. <clears throat> but mercy killing is going on. And unfortunately, there are all kinds of social programs put out by the euthanasia and sponsored by euthanasia education society and like groups uh, wanting to promote more and more of it. Well, here's one. says, my sister-in-law is a screamer. 
she yells at her kids over nothing. Is that bad for the kids? Well, anything to excess can be said to be bad, but yes, it's not as bad, though, as uh, most of us who aren't used to it would think, because the kids get used to it. So they pay less and less attention to it. A screaming mother, a screaming father. Some fathers aren't usually called screamers. They yell. But it could be either one of them. I know parents, and I'm sure everybody else has seen parents who they holler and scream and yell over virtually nothing. I never did like it. I don't like it. and uh, But that's a personal thing with me. But here's what happens. The screamers have been studied. Groups of people who are screamers have been studied to see what happens to the kids. They don't do as well. Some studies have even been done to see whether or not the uh, people who spank, I'm not talking about abusing, I'm talking about spanking, uh, how their children do. Well, spanking is often associated with very loving parents, and the children do fine. No abuse in talk, we're talking about here at all, nothing like that involved. But screaming and spanking doesn't seem to do well. I've often wondered why people scream so much, and uh, I don't have a good answer for that. But I know that there are people that seem to be their lifestyle, wall-to-wall -wall screaming. And uh, I have such strong feeling about it, I know I'm prejudiced, that I... Uh, I tend to get unhappy with parents who do that. Well, <clears throat> here's one. It says, I find I tend to take my wife for granted and wonder if that's bad. Well, why are you doing it? If you wonder if it's bad, it must be a reason, but being taken for granted has two sides to it. Being taken for granted also can mean feeling secure in the relationship. It can be a, a sign of real, a really trusting relationship. <clears throat> On the other hand, being taken for granted can mean that uh, you, there is no consideration being given for the feeling of the partner, and that's not good. Being taken for granted can mean being comfortable with the love and secure in the love. And that's good. But also being taken for granted can mean that uh, the opinions and decisions of the other aren't really important. And so take for granted that whatever would be said or whatever contribution would be made would not be of any particular value. And that wouldn't be good. So simply saying being taken for granted is bad that doesn't necessarily follow, but also saying it's good doesn't necessarily follow. It depends on in what way. But if a person who's asking about it, why? What does it mean to you? I used to uh, sort of joke uh, in, or in trying to help people get oriented to marriage, say the marriage vows ought to be for better, for worse, and for granted uh, as a joke. Because that's what happens most of the time. People get into a pattern of living and they're comfortable and things are going on in the way they should be and the way they're expected to be. And, hey, part of that's being taken for granted. Being secure enough to do so, that doesn't necessarily be a problem. Well, here's another one. Unfortunately, it occurs, and I hear this too often, says my husband had an affair at work. But we got over that problem, but he insists he can't work anywhere else. He's still working with the same person. Should I trust him? Well, obviously you don't. You wouldn't ask the question. You want to. And it's sad that people think they can't work in some other place because that really does make it difficult. It makes it difficult for everybody. You have a right to be troubled by that. 
people have had an affair, then what do they do after they get over it, if they get over it, in the context of if they stop having an affair, they still may feel very warmly toward the other person. It'd be perfectly logical. Uh, and at work, they can't be enemies and have it interfere with the work in most work settings. So these people need to be talked to. And good luck to you. Because it's a hard thing to do to try to adjust to a situation where there has been an ongoing affair and people still working in the same place. Well, here's one. She says, I'm a grandmother and keep my granddaughter at times. Her language seems quite inappropriate. And when I ask her where she hears that, she says, Mommy, Mommy, what can I do? Well, first, is mommy your daughter? If mommy's your daughter, talk to your daughter and remind her what the language expectation is in your home. It may not be, I don't know, it may not be particularly bad what the child's saying, but it may not be appropriate, as you indicated. So is, is mommy your daughter-in-law? Then you have a little additional problem. Talk to your son and tell your son what language you expect in your home what language you don't want in your home. It's your home. And if you're keeping the granddaughter different times, uh, then the child's supposed to learn what is appropriate in each home. They'll do that. That's not a big thing for children. They learn what's appropriate in school, what isn't in different places. That's not a big deal for a child to learn. But you have a right to the language code in your own home. Unfortunately, uh, if it's an in-law, it's a little more ticklish, but if it doesn't work, that kind of talk. And get them both together and tell them what you want and what you don't want. And of course, you have to be nice about it, polite, but uh, you have your rights too. And if uh, you're not being walked on, then chances are they're not being walked on, and the granddaughter's not going to be hurt by learning that, well, when I'm at grandma's, I shouldn't talk a certain way. And you probably found, as, as I have on occasion like that, where the cartoons that come on for children, the language code is uh, quite different from what it used to be. The crudities that they talk about, not necessarily obscene, but implied vulgarities, the crude language, it used to be what we call low-class talk. You remember that? When we had class? Low-class talk was talk not necessarily of people who didn't have money, but people who we thought didn't have better education didn't know better than to talk a certain way. Kind of strange, isn't it, how things like that happen? You listen to cartoons, I only do this when I'm around kids myself, because I certainly have no interest in these cartoons. They're too violent and too rough for me. I'm not old enough yet. I need parental guidance before I can watch some of these kids' cartoons. But language seems to have fallen to a new low. Uh, but say what you want to, and uh, have the children talk the way you want them to, or not talk the way you don't want to in your own home. I think you'll find it. It's an uphill battle, but worth the struggle when you get there. And here's one. It says, my youngest child just graduated from high school and is away this summer before going off to college uh, next fall. And uh, I feel lost already. Is this what's called the empty nest syndrome? Sounds like it. The empty nest syndrome is a problem for three main reasons. <clears throat> See if you fit. One, there are fewer people to talk to. The house suddenly seems vacant. Fewer relationships to be involved with. Um, so it's much more simpler. It is a simpler pattern than it used to be. <clears throat> and then the, what do you do with the extra time? The time that you used to spend. You also, with a child, you may have had obligations and duties you were performing, and now you don't have them. So what are you going to do with them? 
Well, first just enjoy it, the break in the schedule. Wallow in your newfound freedom. But then decide what it is you want to do. Fill in your time. You want to take on more responsibility in some other place, being a volunteer or doing some other kind of work. Uh, you're going to find that even though you feel responsible for a while, you have virtually no authority or whatever over a child who lives away from home. So you may feel like your responsibility continues, particularly when the child calls home and says, I need more money or something else is going on. But you have virtually no authority, meaning you really can't determine what a child does or doesn't do once a child's away from home. So it's back to that same old problem of the responsibility without authority, and that's, that's uncomfortable. But that's part of the emptiness syndrome for a time, but you'll get used to it. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. I know a lot of things, but it's probably what you were put on this earth for because you're so darn good at it. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Is your wife involved with this project? Well, she's going to take care of the money. <laughs> Where's all the food cooked, anyway? We're cooking everything at the Royal Savage. We have insulated uh, Cambros uh, pressure uh, cabinets. We bring everything up in. It won't lose any temperature whatsoever. Uh, the Board of Health has been through every single detail with me to make sure that uh, nothing goes wrong. Uh, they've been super cooperative. Uh, we'll bring everything up, and then we're setting up four separate serving lines, just like four separate restaurants, so that it can go real fast. I'm hoping to get everybody fed in 15 minutes. Did you hear that? Everybody fed in 15 minutes. I knew it would only take me nine or ten, but I didn't know everybody ate that fast. That's kind of amazing to me. Well, you know, they don't want to wait. <laughs> you got to get it done. <laughs> got to get it done, sure. And you, you'll even stick around for the speeches. I know you oh, will. Well, we have to clean up, don't forget, and that's a major part of this. Everything that's up here has got to go back. All the politicians will be going home talking about how wonderful the speeches were, and you'll still be here. We'll be, we'll be cleaning up, but I have a big crew to help, so. Somebody's got to do the dishes. We'll I'll be, dry. We'll be most all night doing dishes. It'll take us till almost morning. Man, this man must be in amazing shape. Because <laughs> how long have you been preparing for this? A couple of weeks? Well, actually, uh, you know, we've been setting up here for two days, but we've been planning on paper and thinking about it for a couple of weeks, yes. I'm not even going to ask you how long you're going to do this stuff. Because I didn't realize you were still... Until my give up. <laughs> <laughs> so someday you wake up and say, no, it's not worth it. But it's been worth it up until now. Yeah, it's great fun. I love it. It's I'm good. having a grand time. Obviously, you're doing a great job at it. Thanks for chatting with us, Don. That's great. Love to be here. Don Benjamin of the Royal Savage, a landmark here in the North Country, and now the Rouse's Point Civic Center with its new facelift is a landmark as well. I have with me the village administrator, Bev Bayshard. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Are you uh, getting a little excited about tonight? Yes, I am. I'm very excited. And I feel very honored to have the governor here in our village. You know, it dawns on, this is the third time I've mentioned it, but it dawns on me that the, we haven't had a governor here in a long time, since 1963. That's right. And my mother has told me many times when the governor came through in 1963. I'd like to say I was a young girl then. You know, I can, <laughs> yeah, well, I can't say I was a young girl then, <laughs> but I was a much younger boy than I am now. But I had already been in this town and working for two years when the governor came here. And although I wasn't in Rouse's Point for the occasion, I remember it very well. There was excitement. Yeah, sure it was. Yeah, I remember it well. Bev, haven't they done a spectacular job in refinishing this uh, Civic Center? Oh, this is one of my greatest prides. Uh, this building is very important to me and my family. I'm very, very proud of it. Why so much for your family? Well, my husband was one of the ones that went down to Massachusetts to bring it back here in parts. Oh, oh that's why. Uh, and my sons played hockey here for many years. And my kids played hockey here against these kids and other teams from Canada many times in the past since the late 1970s. 
And I can remember when the Rouses Point Civic Center was just a dream. That's right. And to have a dream come true is pretty special, don't you think? I think so, too. And then have it rehabilitated this way. I walked in, and uh, Calvin knows it was not a put-on. I was just absolutely blown away by how nice it looked. Yeah, well, that makes me feel very good to hear you say that. I hope everyone tonight will feel the same. You know, one of the things that caught my eye, besides the balloons and all the beautiful tables that Don Benjamin has set up for the dinner tonight, the soundproofing for the acoustics on the ceiling, that had to be an amazing project all by itself. Yes, and we just completed it a very short time ago. So it only adds to tonight. I have no idea what kind of material that might be, but they had to spray it on, didn't they? Yes, it was quite a project. It's a cellulose, and it was done by a local firm. So uh, we're proud of it, and I think it's a fine job. Well, as we stand here and talk, we know what sound felt like and sounded like inside this Rouse's Point Civic Center before. What a difference now. It's almost what we call in the business a dead room. The sound doesn't echo and bounce and so on. So, uh, it, because that adds a tremendous surface area when you spray stuff on like that, and that absorbs all the extra mm -hmm. sound up there. You're so right, and it'll be so nice tonight. We'll be able to hear everything that's said. And not to mention the fact that I imagine that acts as insulation as well. Oh yes, yes. And uh, if you remember when we were back here in the early days, it was quite cold in here. Yes, I do remember those days. Yes, and I hope that this year, now being a grandmother, coming to watch them, that uh, it'll be a little warmer for me. It'll be a little uh, late getting the ice down this year, but this occasion was worth waiting for. That's for sure.